Hi everyone. We all want to feel happier and one of the biggest components of feeling happy is our self-esteem. Right now, Dr. Doug Lyle, the founder of Esteem Dynamics, is going to share with you how you can absolutely change your self-esteem in less than two weeks. First of all, welcome Dr. Doug Lyle. Doug, good to be here. Um, so what is self-esteem and, and how is it different than esteem? Well, actually, uh, self-esteem is a has been real confusing for people to talk about over the years because the, we confuse it with another process that I call esteem. So let me give you an example. If, uh, if someone applies for five jobs that they're really hopeful for to get one of them and all five of them give, give them an offer, they're really excited and they might actually tell their best friend or their mother, wow, that was really good for my self-esteem. But really it has nothing to do with their self-esteem. What that is, is esteem. Esteem is the, the, the process of valuing or being valued. And so this isn't the self that is esteeming them, it's actually other people. So that feels really good because it, being valued by other people is where the rubber hits the road in human psychology and in biology. So in order for us to win mates, uh, gain friends, and also be employed or be uh, in a trading process uh, with the human village, i.e. have customers or be employed, yeah. those three processes are the main competitive processes of human life. And in order to succeed in those processes, literally success itself means that we are esteemed. That's what it means. It means that people valued us more than they valued an alternative person. And so this means that uh, at the root of it, uh, esteem processes are inherently competitive. It doesn't mean it needs to be nasty, but it's, it's the real thing. So you're, you have, in principle, one mate at a time. You have, in principle, a limited number of friends. Uh, and you have, in principle, a limited number of customers and, and job processes. There's only so many things that you can do uh, in a day or in a lifetime in terms of being productive uh, in an economy. And so you, you are being chosen by other people. And you are also attempting to choose them as well. And so these are what I call esteem processes. And there is nothing more important than being esteemed. In other words, we... We desire to have those successes. That's where the rubber hits the road in real live biology. In other words, if you are to survive uh, and you are to reproduce, people must esteem you. That's how that works. Now, where self-esteem is different is that it's actually a different but related process. And it's confusing because uh, very few psychologists have any clarity on the fact that esteem and self-esteem are entirely different things. So esteem is now what I, I've explained, that if you apply for the five jobs and they all say yes, you are esteemed. So, but we don't have a word for that. Uh, we don't say, wow, I'm really esteemed. We say, wow, that was good for my ego. Okay? So uh, ego and self-esteem are interchangeable in our language. Uh, so now this gets really confusing because ego has a lot of negative connotations, like that person has a big ego or, oh, he's just doing that for ego. But the truth is, is if we translate this into uh, accurate terms, what we're really talking about is esteem. So what's inside of our heads is a device that I'm going to call an esteem meter. Uh, this I didn't just make this up. I've actually morphed this from... A, a device or a theoretical device that was hypothesized by Dr. Mark Leary at Duke University in the mid-1990s. Uh, he calls it a sociometer. And sociometer theory is a major theory in social psychology, and it has a great deal of research that demonstrates it. But what this is, is the notion that how we feel is actually being, is going up and down depending upon the feedback that we get from other people whether we being accepted or being rejected. And so the uh, Leary's, Leary's original conception was that in human evolution, it was critical for people to be accepted by their group. 
uh, if you were outside of the group, you were pretty much dead. You're not going to make it uh, as, a, as a, a solitary creature, or your survival prospects are much reduced. You may catch on with another village after you survive for a while on your own, but you're in trouble and you're not re reproducing with anybody. And so the notion of being included or excluded, the line of being in the group or outside the group is a very dramatic line for human beings. And you feel it all the time in your life. If you watch this process, like when you join a new company, you're hoping to actually be included and in being in some secure ring. Uh, if you feel like you're on the outs, if you, you're applying to join a fraternity or sorority, and then you're rejected, you're out, okay? So these, this, the line of who is in the ring and who's outside of the ring is an important you know, uh, delineation in human life. And so this is ancient. This goes way, way back to the original Stone Age villages that human beings evolved in. And those, in those villages, you're designed by nature to do the things that you need to do to be in the group. And so what Leary noticed is that when he devised experiments in a certain way, he could see people's feelings go up and down depending upon whether they, were, they thought they were being accepted by the group or being rejected by the group. And he came to name this process sociometer process or sociometer theory, which is the notion that we have inside of us a very sensitive piece of equipment that is, is very pleased when we get acceptance signals and very upset and depressed and concerned when we get rejection signals. Now, uh, for reasons that we'll see in a few minutes, I've renamed the sociometer an esteem meter. Uh, and that's because, first of all, what I want to do is I want to explain that it's not uh, the original conception sort of had the notion of accepted or rejected by the group, because that's how he originally um, observed this phenomenon. However, we can see that the sociometers or, or, or device actually has separate processes depending upon which market of human life we're looking at. So you can be accepted by the group in your job and accepted by friends and you just got rejected by a mate that you had your heart set on and you can feel pretty bad while you're being completely accepted by the other two groups. Okay, so as a result, we see that there's independent sociometers uh, and in fact, I'm just going to call it one device that's an esteem meter and at any given moment in your life, depending upon what your interaction process is, you're either feeling accepted or rejected, and therefore you're having feelings that are in accordance with, with, that, uh, with, with that meter. Now, there's another reason why I call it an esteem meter, and that is that, um, let, me, let me step kind of quickly into human motivation, and then we're going to finally understand the mystery of self-esteem. Uh, because in, in the esteem meter or sociometer world, there really isn't any conception of self-esteem. It's just this issue. In fact, Mark Leary gave a lecture called, There's No Such Thing as Self-Esteem. Uh, in other words, he just basically said, how you feel about yourself is simply dependent upon the feedback that you're getting from other people. Now, um, he missed a bet, and that's okay. Uh, he, he, was, you know, he is a, a great psychologist, and his, his thinking was a trailblazing uh, insight in our field. Now, we're going to take it a little step further now because we've now had 25, a little more than 20 years since original sociometry theory was conceived. So now we're going to look and see that there is something called self-esteem and that it's extremely important to understand its process in order to optimize our life experience. The um, human beings, uh, what they are doing is they are competing in these marketplaces, whether it's with, for mates, for friends, or for trade. And what we do uh, to compete is we advertise. So advertisements are actually the mechanism uh, by which these competitions are resolved. So when some young lady goes to Macy's and tries on a whole bunch of uh, makeup and clothes, she's getting ready to advertise. And then when she goes to her history class at the university, because there's some handsome young guy that she's interested in, she is advertising. Okay. So when, when a kid is working hard in his electrical engineering class, he is getting ready, he's working on his advertisement because he wants to show that he's got a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford 
and he's going to hand that resume out to potential employers and then they're going to look at his resume against everybody else's resume that he's competing with and that's his advertisement so human human life these decisions uh, in in friendship in romance and in trade are all being resolved through advertising uh, this is exactly what goes on in the animal kingdom that animals advertise uh, uh, to predators for example whether or not they are they are um, a susceptible animal and so you will see prey creatures do a lot of interesting things demonstrating how vigorous and healthy they are and they're basically saying don't come after me it's a waste of time uh, that's that's what they're doing the, uh, they also uh, also within the animal kingdom there's a tremendous amount of advertising for mates so that's what peacock feathers are uh, what the peacock is doing is he's basically advertising to the female the following message. And that is, look at how extraordinary, uh, well-kept and shiny my, my feathers are. They are an incredible advertisement for predators. They are very heavy, uh, so it's not easy to fly under such a tremendous burden. Therefore, you should be extremely impressed that I am still alive. Uh, if I'm able to still be alive under this extraordinary handicap, then my genes must be incredibly good. The guy next to me is still alive, but look at his tail's a drab little tail. So how do you know how good his genes are? Because he doesn't have any challenge, okay? This is completely analogous to how many square feet somebody's house is and where it's located. Um, if you have a 10,000 square foot house at the top of the mountain in, in Beverly Hills, then this took theoretically extraordinary genes or achievement to get there. Uh, whereas if you have a little apartment down in the Central Valley somewhere, then we don't know how great your genes are, but we don't have, it's not clear. So mates would, all things being equal, two men that were equally attractive, if a female is trying to decide between the two of them, pick the guy with the house on the top of the hill in Beverly Hills, which is exactly what happens throughout the animal kingdom. So this is why advertisements of various kinds uh, are, are the lifeblood of animal life and is absolutely the lifeblood of human life. So human beings advertise a variety of things. They advertise for friendship and trade. They advertise what we call character and intelligence. And uh, when it comes to mates, they advertise their singing, their dancing, their athleticism, their beauty, um, and their houses. Uh, this is, these are all five of those major categories, by the way, are standard advertisements throughout the animal kingdom. Uh, I don't know of any other creature on earth that advertises all five, okay? Uh, whales don't advertise their houses. They advertise their, their sound. That's what whale song is. Uh, birds advertise their singing ability and also they advertise their nest. So, i.e. their house. I took the really good territory away from all the other guys. Look at where my nest is located. Not everybody could do this. I'm clearly the toughest, you know, minor bird in the group. So, therefore, you should go with me. Okay? And so, this is the advertising uh, process that goes on. Now, throughout the animal kingdom, we will find that creatures no, not just advertise, but in order to improve their advertisements, they must rehearse. So whales sing and sing and sing, and birds sing and sing and sing, et cetera. Uh, and they'll nest build and nest build and nest build, and then if the females don't like it, they'll start over again. Uh, this is, there's a great deal of, of work that is done. For example, in predator-prey species, you will find if you've got a couple of cats, like I have, uh, every night at a certain time, they start chasing each other around the house. That's, that's predator-prey practice. They're actually, they're practicing both to be chased, which they might be chased by a predator, and they're also practicing chasing behavior. And so they do that, it's fun for them. But there's a reason why they're doing that, and that is that they are rehearsing critical processes necessary for survival and reproductive success. Humans are the most unbelievable rehearsers that there are. So human beings rehearse like no other creature. We, um, so when someone is going down to Home Depot and they are gonna look at new flooring, they are rehearsing their house. And they are thinking about once we put down that beautiful new wood in the kitchen and the dining room and then we put an oriental rug on top of it, 
then when Aunt Millie comes for Thanksgiving, she's going to say, wow, what a beautiful home. And when we do that, uh, so all, all these things that you see people doing, the pride that they feel and the effort that they put out in order to rehearse. They rehearse their hair, they rehearse their makeup, they rehearse their clothes, they rehearse their, their cars, they rehearse their homes, they rehearse their resumes. They're rehearsing constantly as they're working to try to improve their advertisements in order to earn steam. Now, it doesn't do any good to rehearse unless you have a feedback system that can help tell you whether or not your rehearsals are improving your performance. So in theory, what you would like is you'd like a little uh, focus group. If you're a girl named Joanne and you've got your heart set on some guy named Horace, you know, in the history class, then what you would like to do is you would like to have a thousand guys that are very similar to Horace on the internet. And you would like to try on the three different skirt outfits that you plan on uh, buying. And you'd like to have, you know, right at Macy's, just set up the little internet thing, walk out of the dressing room, uh, parade around, turn around, and then have everybody vote. And at the end, they all say, the red with the black shoes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we would want to have feedback in order to make our decisions, in order to uh, improve our advertisements so that we could win more esteem. This is precisely what it is that we would want. But you can't do it. In the Stone Age, you did not want to rehearse right in front of your own audience because then someone who rehearsed in private would look more cool than you. If everybody sees the process by which you painstakingly learned a new dance move, that finally when it looks when you've got it down a month from now, they're like, well, who cares? Oh, I saw what you did. There's nothing impressive about your genes that you can do that. I could have done it. But if you just spring it on them one day, they're like, wow, look at that. You must have an extraordinary cerebellum. Because in order to keep balance and making those really quick and precise movements, you must have extraordinary genes. And I think I, all things being equal between you and Sarah, I have a feeling that I'm going to vote for you because I think your genes are secretly better than Sarah's because she can't do that dance move. So this is precisely what humans do. They, they diligently rehearse in private and then they spring it on the audience in public. And so part of the process is to be essentially secretive about this, to make it look like you're just cool, okay? This is, a, this is just like the peacocks, like, look at how cool I am. Here I am, and look what, what it is that I've got to show, uh, et cetera. It's a method of displaying genetic superiority, is what this is. Now, so here's the bond that we have to rehearse, but we don't know whether or not we're improving. So we would really desperately love a feedback system to exist that could give us feedback uh, on our rehearsals without anybody knowing. And human beings evolved such a mechanism. That mechanism is gonna be what I call your internal audience. It's basically a few little people that are similar to you that sit on your shoulder uh, it's a set of dedicated neural tissue inside of you that really isn't you. It's other people. It's your brain's virtual reality program that is assessing what other people would actually think and feel about you if they were watching your rehearsals. Okay? So when, when uh, Joanne goes to Macy's and tries on those three dresses and looks in the mirror, this is her internal audience that is watching her. Okay? So she watches her own rehearsals and she looks at herself through the eyes of other people and her internal audience gives her either a thumbs up or thumbs down and gives her direction on what it is she thinks that other people would think about her if they were to see her in these circumstances, okay? Now, this is, this is a bizarre set of equipment that we don't believe that any other creature has. The, um, uh, Mark Leary, for example, actually calls it a curse because there's so much internal dialogue and, and dynamics 
uh, inside the person themselves, that it can be very disconcerting. Uh, cognitive psychologists you know, or cognitive therapists actually call it the internal critic, which is very interesting. It's very close to my terminology. Um, and the reason why I believe they call it an internal critic is because, and they'll talk about negative self-talk. Uh, the reason why they ha have this conception is because the people that are coming into them are, are very coming in because they're depressed. And so they, so they're listening to a lot of depressed people that are talking about what their internal audience is saying to them. And the internal audience is giving them a bunch of negative feedback, which is a key source of, their, of them feeling depressed. Now, I'm going to explain that this is a misconception on the part of cognitive behavioral therapy, that it is not a critic, it is an audience. And what that audience is, it's, it's as if it's a little side group of people. And what the side group of people do is they're deciding to have you in the ring or outside of the ring, to accept you as a mate or not accept you as a mate. And what they're doing is they are a proxy for the real live esteem market. So what they do is they give feedback to the esteem meter, just as if they are real people. And so if you rehearse beautifully, the internal audience says, well done, you did a great job. And you get a feeling called pride. And in fact, that is the only way the pride mechanism is generated. Pride mechanism is generated through your internal audience observing your rehearsals and saying, you have done a very fine job. If your internal audience witnesses your rehearsals and your rehearsals are mediocre, then it gives you feedback that says you're kind of disgusting. And this is actually what's happening uh, in the thinking in cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the notion that, wow, you have this internal critic and we have to somehow change that message because that's causing you a lot of pain. Uh, from my conceptualization coming through evolutionary psychology, the notion is, is that no, we pay attention to that message. That message is in fact a, a beautifully engineered device that is saying that your rehearsals are mediocre and that we can expect that your advertisement is gonna be mediocre. And we can expect that the actual esteem signals you're going to win from other people are gonna be mediocre. And therefore, you're gonna to continue to get failure feedback in the markets that you are seeking success in, okay? So this changes the game entirely. So now the, the, the solution is to not talk back to the internal critic, which is what so much psychotherapy is devoted to. Instead, the issue is how can we rehearse differently in such a way as to improve our, our rehearsals so that we improve our advertisements, so that we improve our success in those markets. And in fact, the, the, the process by which the internal audience gives feedback to the esteem meter is what I call self-esteem. So self-esteem is an entirely different process than esteem. They are both aimed at the same meter, the esteem meter. It is the generator of how it is that you feel. So when, you're, when, you're, when you get negative feedback from your internal audience, you feel lousy. Now you can have a, a bizarre situation like Millie Vanilli had 20 years ago, where they were getting extraordinarily positive feedback from the outside world. But from the inside audience, the inside audience knew they were a fraud. And so that the pressure of that kind of contradiction, which is a bizarre contradiction, could only happen in the modern environment. The whole world think that you're wonderful and throw a lot of money at you for something that you didn't do, okay? Uh, that you bluffed them, that's what that was. Did that, you know, one of those young men committed suicide, uh, ultimately behind this. So the, um, this is a, uh, uh, in general, what's gonna happen is that the, the person is getting a self-esteem mechanism is giving you a steady stream of feedback about its observations of your rehearsals. Now, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a few minutes to look at one of the great obstacles in human life towards achieving any kind of positive change for yourself. And this is how this is gonna work. 
all action of all animals comes as a result of cost benefit analysis. The reason why you scratch your head like this is because your mind runs a cost benefit analysis that it's in your best interest of survival and reproduction to scratch that itch. Sorry, I just did that to everybody that's watching because now they're going to itch. It turns out that itching as a concept is uh, highly, uh, it's a social contagion in humans. Uh, and that's because we evolved in little groups and as, a, as these primates in Africa, uh, if one person started itching, there's a good chance that whatever caused their itching is crawling up you too. So you instantly become more sensitive. So sorry about that. <laughs> I just messed that up. That's okay. On we go. Is that yeah. the same, um, Dr. Lyle, is that the same thing with yawning? Because it seems like that's contagious too. Yeah, absolutely. Same kind of thing, i.e. it's time to go to sleep. So, um, so it's going to turn out that you have a, um, where was I? I'm oh, sorry. I think that you said that, um, you, I think that we want to uh, do as little as possible, I think is what you Oh, cost-benefit analysis. So your, your behavior is always uh, operating under the constraints of cost-benefit analysis because the nature of life is that you are attempting to use your time and energy optimally in order to, to translate your time and energy into the DNA molecule. So you, you don't know that this is true and no animal knows it, but actually animal minds are engineered in order to acquire the resources in competition uh, with other with the landscape and other competitors in order to try to reproduce DNA and uh, So life is a has a singular purpose, which is the optimum reproduction of DNA We have now co-opted that and we no longer do that as humans, but the machinery inside of you still works that way So people can say I don't want to have any children But that doesn't mean that they're not extremely interested in romance and sex They're as interested as they ever were Okay, and so this is so you, the, the machinery is driving you to do things that in the Stone Age would have caused children, uh, even though now what you're trying to do is just ride the feelings that guided that behavior but not have the, the outcomes. So, uh, now, so cost benefit analysis is the central, uh, is the central issue when it comes to the decision making of organisms to do any behavior. And when it comes to a person making any change, they're simply running cost-benefit analysis on what the, the ultimate payoff is for whatever it is that they're contemplating doing. So there's models of change that you'll hear about, pre-contemplation, contemplation. This is all just non-theoretical, cor gross correlations of observations of humans. There's nothing interesting at all in any model of change that like somebody wrote up 10 or 15 years ago and everybody quotes these days. No, if you want to understand change of humans, you have to understand that the mind is running a cost-benefit analysis on gene survival. And the way it works on those issues is it's seeking happiness. It's seeking pleasure, it's seeking satisfaction, and it is attempting to avoid pain, both emotional pain and physical pain. Emotional and physical pain are signs of genetic losses. Pleasure and happiness are signs of genetic gains. So the system is designed to attempt to use its energy and time in order to construct a pattern of behavior that will optimize its happiness and pleasure mechanisms. That's how it's designed. Most of your behavior patterns are the way they are because your brain has experimented with subtle permutations of a behavior. Should I stop at this Starbucks or that Starbucks? Which one's more convenient? Which one has the longest lines? Which one is the easiest in and out for my car, etc. Okay. In other words, all of these are these little permutations that the brain goes through to, to make cost-benefit analysis that will arrive at a pattern of behavior that for people is usually very stable. And the reason it's stable is that is the pattern that is optimized the cost-benefit machine rate. Uh, uh, analytic machinery, which is your emotional life, uh, which is sort of telling you that this is the best deal. So now when we contemplate change, it's because there's been a change in the payoff matrix. So a new company has offered you a job and it's 20% more than your current company. Huh. Okay. Uh, it's 10 minutes further to work. Okay. But it's a prettier drive. Okay. That gets rid of the 10 minutes. So now if it's 20% more, uh, no, are they going to want me to work 20% more hours? No, they've assured me that everybody leaves at 5 o'clock. 
oh, well, I don't leave at five o'clock here. I get pushed to stay over a lot of the times. So you run a cost-benefit analysis on this. Uh, this is precisely what it is that you do. And you make changes when the cost-benefit value proposition has shifted in a way that indicates that you should change. Now, very often people have goals that they want to achieve. Let's suppose they want to write the great American novel. And they think they might be able to write it. They have evidence that they might have a great story to tell. But you see that they procrastinate. And you wonder why it is that they don't do it. Or a person is 50 pounds overweight. And they would desperately like to be more attractive. And they do not have a mate that they're happy with or a mate at all. Or the mate that they have is not interested in them because they're 50 pounds overweight. And so as a result, they suffer consistently day to day, a steady stream of steam signals that tell them you're 50 pounds overweight and you're not appealing and you're really not inside my ring. Okay? So they get these signals and they want to change. The problem is, is that they're confused about what food to do and then they learn about different ideas and they try different ideas. But at the end of the day, they find out there doesn't seem to be any free lunch. It turns out that uh, everything that I do in order to lose this weight requires some kind of sacrifice. And the reason why that's true is, uh, the reason why they haven't done it is because the cost-benefit analytics on the entire picture say, keep the steady pattern of behavior that you have. So what will change the behavior? Uh, let's suppose we're gonna go back, uh, we're gonna shift away from weight, that uh, weight has the same aspect to it. We're gonna now find a major obstacle to human change in a very unlikely place. The, um, we're gonna look at the nature of human self-destruction. So we're gonna now see a, a big reason why the alcoholic doesn't put down the bottle, why the overweight person doesn't put down the rich food, and why the great writer does not write, sit down and write the great American novel. We're gonna find out, and we're gonna find out that the, that the process that is taking place is a cost-benefit analysis about how much esteem a person might win or lose by taking on this project. Now, I want you to imagine a person that wrote a book and it was pretty well received, and there was a lot of critics that said, this person has great promise, okay? Now, they find themselves with writer's block, and they can't get themselves to do it. Why? They're procrastinating indefinitely. What's re the reason is, is that the outside world has given them signals that indicates that they expect that the person, if they put out efforts, is going to do some great deed. <clears throat> this is going to cause a dynamic. The person has to run a cost-benefit analysis on whether or not it's worth trying. Because if they try their very best, it may turn out that their second book, it doesn't live up to expectations at which point they will actually lose esteem by doing their very best work that they could do. Because they can sense that this is a very distinct possibility, the right strategy is to procrastinate indefinitely and not do it. As long as people keep saying, oh, but you really have the chops to write the great American novel, then they've still got that esteem. So literally by doing nothing, it puts them in the optimal position. Now they don't like it because it's not as much esteem as they would get as if they wrote the novel and people considered it a great success, okay? So they are teased by the possibility that they should do this, but they are intimidated by the possibility that they can't. And the esteem that they could lose in exchange for the effort uh, of their best effort is something they're, they're really holding on to the short money and basically trying to milk it for as long as possible. The same thing is true of an alcoholic who is bright, capable, uh, wonderful person, has great friends, and the great friends say, Jimmy, you gotta just put down the bottle. You're too smart for this. What Jimmy will do is he will say, yeah, yeah, I know, I'm gonna get to it soon. So they will procrastinate indefinitely uh, and basically say, I know that you think I have the emotional stability and the capability and the genetic uh, uh, chops to quit this, but you know what? I'm not so sure I do. 
So therefore, if I really try and I fail, I'm going to lose more esteem than if I just don't try and don't get to it. Okay. Now, uh, this is, uh, I have a name for this. We could call this the esteem trap. But the truth is we've learned earlier that the concepts of self-esteem and ego, those two words are the same words uh, interchangeably to people, i.e. I got accepted by five of my top schools. That was really good for my ego. And it was really an esteem meter process. I have termed this phenomenon when the expectations are too high and you are intimidated out of effort. I call this the ego trap. Okay? This is where the esteem meter is giving signals that indicates that there is too much esteem to lose and you are better off stalling and procrastinating. And the tragedy is that oftentimes people will do this their whole lifetimes. Some young girl gets the Emily Dickinson Award in her high school for being the great poet. Uh, and then what does she do? She never picks up the pen again, and doesn't even dare try. Uh, how many people who were voted most likely to succeed in high school literally you know, go to earth and hide and never are should seen in another reunion. This is because this kind of feedback or esteem uh, where it is overcooked or you're overvalued puts you in a very vulnerable position and puts you in a situation where the best move is often to procrastinate indefinitely. Now, I want you to see how this could have evolved in human nature as a tactic. Uh, imagine a young man that is average attractiveness, average charm, average athleticism, average intelligence. This guy has average stamped on his forehead that says that he's going to get an average attractive maid and have average children, and that's going to be his genetic legacy. Now, he's 17 or 18 years old, and he goes out on his first hunt, and he separates out from the other young men, and he comes across a young wildebeest with its foot stuck in a snake hole. And he takes out a big rock and he bludgeons it over the head. And then he stands 30 feet away and throws a spear into it. And then he drags this thing home. And they have a big feast. And he tells a story about how he stared down two saber-toothed cats and then hit this thing in full stride. Yeah. The, uh, now, suddenly, the sevens and eights girls in the village are winking at him. Okay? So now they're like, wow, we underestimated him. So now it's going to turn out that his genes are potentially going to get lucky in the next few weeks, and he just might wind up with a fancier situation as a genetic legacy than if he, if he goes home and tells the truth. So if he over-advertises the situation, it's actually in his best interest. And now it's also in his best interest when it's time to go on the next hunt. It would be a very good idea to sprain your ankle conveniently uh, the day before. Okay? because then you might get to ride the same legacy for another three or four weeks. So you can see how the procrastination dynamic would serve the interest of any human who felt that they were probably being overrated by the group. Now, obviously a, a reasonable solution to this is for the writer to write in quietly where nobody even knows he's writing and to be very secretive that he's even doing this. But he's got a problem. And that is that he's designed by nature with an internal audience. And that internal audience is genetically programmed to essentially have expectations for him that are similar to the expectations that he believes that people in the village would have of him. So therefore, buried inside of his own skull is a group of people that actually think that he's supposed to write the great American novel. And as a result, uh, when he sits down to write it sometimes, no genius flows from his pen. And as a result, he's embarrassed in front of his own internal audience. And therefore, he procrastinates. And he procrastinates indefinitely. Okay? This is why the person doesn't start to lose weight. Because the truth is, what's the point? Okay? The, internal, the person doesn't believe they're probably going to stick with it anyway, and they're not likely to have that great a success. So therefore, a better move is to procrastinate indefinitely. That's called Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is a very successful company that has made a fortune. They are not in the business of anybody losing weight. They know quite well that nobody does their program loses any weight. They've got scientific evidence that nobody loses weight. Why are they there? They are there 
partially because of a clever alliteration uh, that, that works beautifully on for humans to say. And it also is saying something. It is saying, I'm working on it. I know I'm overweight, but I'm working on it. Okay? This is a bluff. It's just saying, yeah, I'm I'm doing the culturally um, sanctioned process by which I am doing this. I'm not there yet, okay? But I'm working on it. This is what this is. Weight Watchers is status defense, front, center, and in the middle. That is its purpose. They are selling esteem. It is an advertisement that the person is intelligent and conscientious and emotionally stable, and they are in fact working on the problem, even though all evidence to the contrary is staring us in the face. So okay. they're selling esteem, but not self-esteem. That's correct. They are selling us beautifully said, Lisa. That is exactly what they're doing. Now, the, uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the solution to this brutal trap that I call the ego trap. The, um, this, is, this is no fun to be in the ego trap. The, the, you feel like a fraud, you are procrastinating, you are not actually making worthwhile progress towards your goals, you are not improving your advertisement to compete more effectively in these markets. You are in a holding pattern and it hurts. Uh, the telltale signs of the ego trap are uh, mad at myself, um, frustrated, depressed, demoralized, even suicidal, bitter, angry, in other words, people can be very frustrated by the fact that they are put in this trap, sometimes by well-meaning friends and family, sometimes by a domineering and highly testosteroneized mother or father who wants a person to climb the world and be the top of the dominant hierarchy in the world, um, i.e. a lot of high achieving people have a chip in their head that basically says, we're seeking world domination. Um, it was built in there in the Stone Age to seek domination of the village, and it feels very doable uh, inside of some people. They're like, you can get to the top of this dominance hierarchy. And so the parent can be pushing a child, and, and the child can be getting all kinds of positive feedback from their achievements, and the parent uh, shines the light on the kid, brags about them, talks about the big, bad, beautiful things that the kid is going to accomplish, selling, selling, selling their genetic greatness. Meanwhile, putting some child in the ego trap. The, um, the media can do this. Some hum hopeful in the Olympics that has a shot, you know, at winning a gold. Everybody puts the cameras out and you know talk talks about how this great thing that they're going to do. This is just phenomenal uh, pressure that takes place. And so uh, some people have to face it. They don't really have any choice. They're backed into a corner and they have to do the best they can. But very many of us have expectations put on us, uh, sometimes well-meaning and sometimes through a really misguided and vicious process where the, the expectations are too high and we are now in the ego trap. Now, what is the solution to the ego trap? The solution to the ego trap is actually by educating the internal audience that the crowd is wrong. And in fact, you are not so great. Okay? And this is a bit of a painful process that takes place. So the internal audience, if you're, quote, the great young author, uh, or you are the alcoholic, who everybody expects you to do this because you're so smart and capable, why do you have this problem? Then what you have to deal with is the fact that you are aware that you may not be successful. And the internal audience may be disappointed as it watches your early efforts as you stumble and fumble. Now, what we need to do is we need to change the goal structure. The goal structure that people have is the goals of great advertisements that win esteem from the outside people. That's the goals. That is the goals that people seek. The goal is I'm going to lose 50 pounds and rock the beach in the bikini and then all the guys are going to want me. That's the goal. Okay? The goal is I'm going to sing at the Grammys and everybody's going to throw me money in contracts and say that I'm the greatest thing that ever walked. That's the goal. We need to change the goal. The goal is going to not be to win esteem. The goal is going to be to earn self-esteem. This is an entirely different process. 
and it requires a shift of focus and understanding about our own psychology. The self-esteem process is generated when your internal audience observes your rehearsals and they respect them. The internal audience will shift its feeling about you as it watches you work diligently. So the goals that we set are not lofty goals of achievement of esteem winning. They are in fact prosaic goals that can be earned every day through very steady, diligent effort. This is, uh, so if I was coaching a writer, I would say here, and the goals that we set are goals that are 100% within your control, that nobody can stop you from achieving these goals. This is the proper way to set goals. So the goals for the writer would be, turn on your computer every day, have an hour and a half set aside, read your previous writings for 30 minutes to orient you as to what it is that you had written before, and then your job is to write for 60 minutes or at least generate 750 words, whichever comes first, okay? Your job is to generate that, uh, to continue to type, or you could, for example, set the goal that you're not, you're not to stop until we've got 750 words. No matter how pissed for that 750 words is, it's not relevant. Your goal is to generate 750 words after you have read your previous work for half an hour, okay? At the end of that time, you're done. Now, what's going to happen after five or six or seven or eight or nine, 10 days of this? That if you do this, what will happen is, the first thing that will happen is your internal audience will be disappointed that your greatness is not what everybody thought it was. And therefore you will not, you will struggle and you will not generate anything brilliant. And it will say, oh, I thought you were a genius. That's what we were told. And it appears that you are not, you're just a struggling writer. That's correct, okay? And there will be a loss of esteem that the person will feel. It will cause them anxiety to lose that esteem because anxiety is gonna be a signal of loss. And therefore, we're like, mm, that's a little anxiety provoking to actually sit down here and do this in front of my internal audience. It's like, that's correct. But if you do this four or five or six days in a row, what will happen uh, in certainly after two weeks. But if you do this, what will happen is the internal audience will observe that you are working hard. And it will say, you are working hard and you are doing a good diligent effort this is no joke you are making some progress here i respect you nobody on earth disrespects hard work you may want the awe of an adulation of the village who thinks that you just sprung this masterpiece without thinking on the village to show your genetic greatness but the truth is, is that your self-esteem mechanism is observing all the stumbles and fumbles. And it knows what you look like naked, okay? And as a result, it will, if you work at this and you improve your performance and you're improving your advertisement, the internal audience will say, you deserve my respect. I'm not in awe of you. You are not seeing greatness. But what I am seeing is character, and I respect this, okay? And look, you're actually coming up with some very good stuff. This may turn into something, okay? This is self-esteem. And your self-esteem will change way ahead of your esteem. You must lose three pounds before you can lose 30. That's how it works. And so if you do the things necessary properly to lose three pounds, which is to reduce the fat in your diet, get rid of the oil, get rid of the rich foods, eat you know, high fiber, whole natural plant food to dominate your diet, whether or not you include some animal food is really fairly irrelevant. And what you do is you balance this diet more closely associated with the diet of our natural history, and you exercise moderately and solidly, and you do this repetitively for several days, you will find that you will lose a pound. And if you do it for a month, you're gonna lose three or four pounds. 
And at the end of that month, nobody is going to be saying to you, wow, you could really rock a bikini, Joanne. No, because you went from 40 pounds overweight to 36. But you know you did it. Your self-esteem mechanism knows that you did it. And your feelings, your internal generated feeling about yourself has improved dramatically. The world doesn't know yet. It's not sure where you're going. Uh, the self-esteem mechanism, unfortunately, does not turn around on a dime. So if you do this today, it doesn't, it's not impressed. Why? Because it's seen this kind of thing before. It's seen you sit down for an hour and try to start your novel. It's seen you uh, put down the booze for a day. It's seen you make little starts, but it's not impressed. So it folds its arms and says, I'm not impressed, but I don't disrespect it, but I'm not giving you any big pride today because you don't deserve it. Okay? Self-esteem is the reputation you have with yourself. It's as if a group of people were watching you. If you suddenly were a flake that didn't show up for work and then you suddenly show up for work on time one day, they're not going to applaud you and say good things. You can't talk to this audience and tell them to talk and think differently and say nice things to you so we have the internal critic quiet down. No, that's not going to work. We have to earn our way to self-esteem. And not only do we have to earn our way to self-esteem, we have to continually earn our way to self-esteem. The audience is there to guide you and to tell you whether or not you're making good use of your time and energy in this life, okay? And so if you are doing a mediocre job, it will instantly start to chisel away at the self-esteem mechanism. There are people that have been puzzled and give a very dark view of the nature of happiness. They'll say, don't even bother pursuing it. It's capricious, doesn't mean anything, it doesn't last. The, uh, I have to say that coming out of Buddhist philosophy, there's a notion of don't want, don't want anything, just do this little thing over and over again. Uh, I like part of it, which is they're essentially putting the process in front of the outcome. So just do this little thing and don't focus on the outcome. That's fine. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are designed by nature to integrate our internal rehearsals with the outcomes that we so dearly seek. And the moods of happiness happen from two directions. They come from the internal audience observing our excellent execution of practice, where it is that we are improving in our rehearsals and building a legacy of achievement that will eventually be sprung on the audience that we can show the real audience and compete with our competitors and win the love and respect and esteem and finances that we deserve and that we seek, okay? The, the notion that we should not be seeking those things and that happiness is ephemeral is absurd. You are a creature that's designed by nature to compete in these markets and to get yourself to not compete in these markets is ridiculous. That is not a solution for human beings. The solution is this integrated picture that we want to be earning esteem in the right way from the people that matter. So we do not try to bluff people with our greatness like Milli Vanilli to get esteem that we don't deserve. That won't work for human happiness. What will work for human happiness is to roll up your shirt sleeves, to look at the people and, and their esteem that you are seeking to compete with. So if you're a 50 year old woman, you're not seeking to compete with Tom Brady to be a quarterback. You are seeking to compete in your arena. You're not seeking to date Justin Bieber, I hope, okay? You are, there are people and there are markets of esteem that you are seeking to compete in. And if you are unhappy, your unhappiness is a signaling device to tell you that you are not competing effectively. This is not a disturbance of the chemical imbalance of your brain for which you need Prozac. This is a brilliantly engineered evolutionary device to tell you that we suspect that you are not getting the feedback that you could earn, okay? And that there is something amiss in the balance of your life about how you are expending your time and energy, that we are not working the process as effectively as we should work it, and that we need to change something about what it is that we're doing in order to be successful to earn the esteem that we seek, okay? So this is the nature 
of the ego trap, self-esteem, esteem, human achievement, and the obstacles that are in the way for a better life. The uh, better life is almost always possible for everyone. We can always improve our understanding of how it is that our mind works and how we should be balancing our behavioral energies. Uh, this is just a, an exploration into some major uh, opportunities for clarification so that we can, uh, can use this concept of earning self-esteem towards esteem in a way that optimizes our life experience. Okay. And Dr. Lyle, you said that um, the, the um, audience isn't going to believe it within a day. Yes. How long does it take for the audience to start to believe it? It's a very good question. And let me, let me give you an analogy that is maybe hopeful so that you can see how this would work. Um, I want you to think of yourself as, um, I want you to think of it as a, as a young guy that works at a car wash named Jimmy. And he's talented. He's capable, very capable detailer. He's a good kid. His internal audience is like the owner operator of the car wash that's watching Jimmy work. And the owner operator is extremely frustrated with Jimmy because he sees Jimmy's talent, but he sees him flake off. He doesn't show up for work on time. Sometimes he doesn't show up at all. Then when he shows, sometimes he does brilliant work. It's like, really frustrating. And the owner finally gets so frustrated one day, he says, listen, Jimmy, I'm telling you, I'm thinking about just giving up on you. Okay. I'm thinking about just firing you. You can go scratch. And people reach that point with themselves. Very often their internal audience will be so disgusted with them that they will feel like, oh, just, you know, you're just worthless. Just forget it. Okay. The phrase, I'm disgusted with myself or I an I'm angry with myself, could not possibly be translated into what a horse thinks or a cat thinks because they don't have an internal audience. They're an integrated unit with simply it's them against the world and there is no internal dialogue between different entities. Only humans have this. So it makes sense to people to say, I'm disgusted with myself, I'm angry with myself, or I'm proud of myself. That's indication that there are independent social psychological entities housed in the same skull, and that this is how it's designed. Now, so you can imagine this as the owner operator of a car wash, as the internal audience, and Jimmy is the kid, the talent. And the owner operator says, listen, I'm just letting you know, I'm really disgusted with you. And I'm thinking about giving up on you. But if you would just get it together, I might make you head of the whole detailing division, okay? And give you a big raise in promotion. So it's there for the offering. It's up to you. The next Monday, the kid shows up on time. What does the owner think? Grab a towel. Not impressed, okay? Tuesday, the kid shows up on time. Yeah, grab a towel, not impressed. Wednesday shows up on time. Hmm, barely raises an eyebrow. Grab a towel. Thursday, hmm. Friday, hmm. Friday, that owner operator goes home, tells his wife, hmm, that kid's never had five days in a row where he did it right. He's thinking, yeah, but he's just going to goof off. He'll stay out late on Sunday night, got his paycheck. I'll bet he breaks my heart Monday morning. I'll bet that flake won't show. Monday morning, kid shows up. Hey, Jimmy, little surprise on the part of the owner-operator. The emotional reaction is different than it was the first Monday. Grab a towel. Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, Friday. The owner operator has no choice. At the end of that week, he goes home and tells his wife, something's changed. Something has fundamentally changed. That kid has never done two weeks in a row well. I'm upset because I think he's going to flake out on me on Monday. 
that kid's going to break my heart on Monday. I just know he's going to break my heart on Monday. But he might not. He might not. God, I hope this is real. I really hope it's real, but I don't believe it. Monday morning of the third Monday is high drama. Guy's watching the clock and Jimmy shows up 10 minutes early. Now, how does he feel? Hey, Jimmy, good to see you. There is a strong, powerful, positive emotional response of relief and excitement that this is a change is real. This is exactly how it works with the internal audience and you. This is the great story of Rocky. This is why the story of Rocky is so inspiring. It's about a person that gets backed into a corner and essentially works his way out of it because he has no choice. And we watch through an extraordinary metamorphosis as his self-esteem rises and rises and rises. We see that when he puts his hands up as he climbs the monument the second time when he couldn't get there before earlier, that he has achieved something that he knows he's achieved and he's out there all by himself. Nobody is watching him when he got there, okay? He has prepared as well as he can possibly prepare. And his, his goal is to go the distance. But really, the real go the distance is, did I go the distance and make the most of my potential? Whatever happens in the ring happens in the ring. Whether or not the girl falls in love with you or not is not up to you. Whether or not that person becomes your friend is not up to you. And whether or not they give you the contract or give you the job or give you the award is not up to you. You are not in charge of the esteem that you eventually win or lose. You are only in charge of your self-esteem. And the beautiful part about it is you are the only person that's in charge of the self-esteem. Okay. Self-esteem is quiet. It is not as loud as esteem because esteem is the loud, noisy payoff that comes from other people literally willing to sign a check and make love. Okay. But self-esteem is the quiet guidance system that is the foundation of all happiness. And we have extraordinary control. We have complete control over it. The control is indirect. The therapies of today think that the control is direct. That we can simply talk our way out of it and say good things to yourself and stare on the mirror and give yourself good messages. This is not how it works. Okay? You can only get out of the trap by earning your way out of the trap. And your internal audience will observe those efforts and slowly, but, but actually clearly and definitively have no choice but to change their opinion of you if you earn it. Okay? And so that's the message of the day. That no matter how deep a hole you're in, whatever the circumstances are that have you intimidated or demoralized or confused or et cetera, it doesn't matter. Okay? Whatever the source of the depression is, um, your, your job is to set the micro goals of what it is that you have control over, execute on those diligently, and you will find inexorably your self-esteem will rise and you will get a phenomenal, important relief in a matter of days. And that's how it works. Well, thank you, Dr. Lyle. What a hopeful message that uh, regardless of whatever else is happening in the world, we have control over our own self-esteem through our actions and pure grit and hard work. That's how it works. Dr. Doug Lyle is the director of research at the True North Health Center, and he's also a frequent speaker at the McDougal program. He's got a book called The Pleasure Trap, which is about the hidden forces that get in our way when we're trying to pursue health and happiness. The links to all of his resources are going to be in the description below. And while you're there, you can hit subscribe to stay tuned for more pointers. And let us know in the comments what you do that gives you self-esteem. Thanks, everyone.